and welcome to Global Weather Observations from Science Quality Millimeter Wave Atmospheric Sounding Radiometer on a 6U CubeSat with Professor Steve Rising. I'm Mike Hamilton, your host for this IEEE Microwave Theory and Technique Society webcast, which is sponsored by MTTS. Before we start, I'll mention a few housekeeping items. First, this presentation will be archived. A recording should be posted approximately 24 hours after we finish the presentation. We'll send all registrants an email when the archive webinar goes up so you can revisit it or share it with your colleagues. Second, we encourage questions. We'll answer them after the talk, but you can submit them at any time during the discussion. Enter your question in the Q&A box in the webcast window and don't forget to click Submit. Third, some words about the interface. You can enlarge slides by clicking on the rectangle at the top right of the live slide window. You can also enter full screen mode if you desire. Refresh or reload the current web page if you encounter any problems. With regards to audio, if you're listening over your computer speakers, you can adjust the media player volume. You may also need to adjust your speakers or your system's master volume. The icons at the bottom of the webinar window include a resource list. Clicking that link will start the process to download copies of the slides to be presented today. Now let's introduce our speaker. Professor Stephen Rising is a professor in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. Dr. Rising received a PhD degree in Electrical Engineering from Stanford in 1998, where he was supported by NASA Earth Systems Science Fellowship. Uh, his research interests uh, focus on remote sensing of the Earth's atmosphere and oceans from airborne platforms, small satellites and CubeSats, as well as passive remote sensing systems based on low noise mimics from microwave to submillimeter wave and terahertz frequencies. He's been principal investigator on multiple grants from agencies including NASA, NSF, DOD, and ESA. Dr. Rising served as associate editor of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Letters from 2004 to 2013, and he's currently serving as the PI of both the Tempest D NASA Earth Venture Technology CubeSat mission and the Twice Instrument Incubator, incub incubator Program from the NASA Earth Science Technology Office. So now it's my pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Professor Rising for Global weather observations from a science quality millimeter wave atmospheric sounding radiometer on a 6U CubeSat. Steve? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Good day to everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I will get started. Our, as Mike said, I'm the principal investigator of uh, the project, uh, Tempest D project, and uh, wanted to. Uh, I uh, appreciate uh, the other people who are working on it. Uh, we're at Colorado State University. Uh, it's led by Colorado State University, uh, Chris Kumaro, it's a professor uh, leading the atmospheric science portion. Dr. Westberg is involved, and Professor Chandra is leading the science engineering interface. And our postdocs and students are involved as well. Uh, and our partners at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, in Pasadena. Uh, produced the instrument and uh, supported the uh, instrument um, uh, integration and testing with the spacecraft and uh, continue to work with us to this day. Uh, Blue Canyon Technologies has provided the spacecraft. Uh, they're in Boulder, Colorado, and they have, they're doing the mission operations. Uh, also, NASA Wallops is providing ground station uh, communication support. And, uh, and so we thank uh, everyone involved in the project. And I will um, get started here. So if you, if you look at this slide, uh, looking at uh, sort of like uh, the game shows with door number one, door number two, and door number three, this is looking at uh, two different sensors. And if I tell you that one of them is on a CubeSat and the other one is um, from the uh, NOAA operational uh, satellite uh, that operates for many years and uh, is one of the standards uh, in the field. Uh, the question is, can you tell which one is which? It's just an image from the Southern Ocean. And then if we zoom out to look at the entire globe, uh, we see global measurements from each of these two. And so we see a little bit of difference in the white space, which just gives us an idea of the swath width for coverage. But the question is, which one is which? And so if you guess that uh, sensor B is the uh, 
NOAA operational weather satellites, then you've got it right. That's the NOAA Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder, uh, manufactured by Northrop Grumman. And uh, you see in the left photo, it was integrated by Ball Aerospace on a very large satellite platform. So in the circle on the left, the uh, sensor is, uh, has a mass of 75 kilograms. It takes a power of 100 watts. And uh, tell my students it's $4 signs on Yelp. So then on the right, uh, about a factor of 20 smaller in uh, mass and power consumption and, and much cheaper, uh, we see on the bench at the top, uh, we see Tempest D. Tempest D is uh, 4U in size. I'll define that in a little bit. Uh, and we see the project manager, Todd Geyer, on the left. Uh, then Heather Lim, Alan Tanner, Sharmila Padmanabhan, Rudy Bendik, and Boon Lim from left to right. Uh, Sharmila, uh, just to the right of the instrument, was uh, my PhD student at Colorado State University. Uh, graduated uh, almost 11 years ago, and she's been at uh, JPL ever since. And uh, on the bottom right, you see the complete satellite, which I'll show in detail more. But that, that instrument is uh, four out of six units of that CubeSat. So if we kind of review the CubeSat standard, so just like um, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, uh, you know, 802.11, uh, take your pick, are, are um, important standards in, uh, in wireless technology, uh, the CubeSat is a standard for satellites. And so once people have the standard and they know the interface to uh, match, then they're able to be creative. And uh, it gives a lot of freedom because uh, the, uh, you know, it's simpler to launch the satellite. And so this CubeSat standard was defined 20 years ago by our colleagues at uh, Stanford University and Cal Poly as a 10 centimeter cube with 1.3 kilograms of mass. So that's about four inches on a side for uh, uh, those who still use imperial units. and. Uh, and about um, three pounds per U. So uh, they can be not only one U though, uh, they can go to much larger in size. And so uh, typical sizes are uh, one, two, three, six U. Right now, uh, some people are working on 12 U satellites. Uh, and, and so if we look at a three U, the photo on the right shows the three U CubeSats, which are 34 by 10 by 10 centimeters. So for imperial units, it's uh, close to 14 inches by four inches by four inches, and it's up to four kilograms of mass. So the, then the six U CubeSat uh, factor would be just taking two of those three U's, like you see in the photo, and lining them up lengthwise next to each other. So then that doubles uh, one of the 10 centimeter dimensions to be 34 by 20 by 10. But the great thing is that the standard allows uh, has been flexible enough to uh, deploy 50% uh, larger mass. Instead of just four kilograms, it's moved up to 12 kilograms. And so that provides additional science capability for 6U CubeSats because that greatly increased solar panel area allows us a lot more um, charge for uh, battery on board and then uh, potential for redundancy in communications and improved calibration, things like that. So with this CubeSat standard, um, one of the ways to uh, get your payload into space is offered by NASA in the US uh, for nonprofit organizations, NASA centers and universities are uh, granted, uh, go through a simple grant process uh, for free launch through the CubeSat launch initiative. That's also called CSLI. And as you see in the lower left, uh, 38 out of 50 U.S. states have uh, contributed uh, CubeSat for launch, and uh, they're divided in the far left corner, you see, lower corner, lower left, <laughs> excuse me, you see the applications are uh, divided among uh, technology demonstration, scientific research, education, and they often overlap. And then on the right side, it shows that there are many different launch vehicles that they launch from. So. Speaking of number of CubeSats, over 1,000 CubeSats uh, have been launched and flown in the last 20 years. And our 
colleague, uh, Professor Michael Swartout at St. Louis University, keeps a great database for that. He's been tracking that for years, and uh, this is from uh, his paper at the CubeSat Developers Workshop in San Luis Obispo, uh, held every April. I recommend that uh, that workshop if you're interested and able to attend. So uh, you can see that before about 2013 on the graph, uh, there were 25 or fewer CubeSats launched each year, and then it really increased. Uh, and um, and then you see this huge peak at 2017. So a lot of people know about the Planet uh, CubeSat deployment where they uh, deployed 100 uh, and they launched it from India with the PSLV rocket. And then they had another launch, um, I believe the next year uh, with about 70 more. Uh, and so uh, if we look at the mission type, so if we look at the pie chart, we see that the bright red is a technology demonstration, the deeper red is uh, communications, uh, and the uh, green is educational uses, the yellow is science, and uh, orange is earth imaging. So we see that between science and earth imaging, we have about half of the CubeSats, uh, but then technology demonstration is about a quarter on the left of the pie chart, and, um, and then education and communications uh, bring in the rest. So you can see that this orange part for Earth imaging has been a very large uh, and increasing part, especially for uh, 2017 with those 100 CubeSats out of about the 300, uh, which is the peak there uh, for 2017. So, uh, but the science is, is also playing an important role in, in terms of the yellow. It may not be as many CubeSats, but basically there's been a transition from, um, from uh, education and uh, technology demonstration more toward useful things uh, in terms of uh, bigger scope. Uh, and, and so the, the science capability is really what we're showing here. And I just put this in from uh, Michael Swartout's database uh, to show you that, uh, you know, 40% of the CubeSats are launched from the U.S., and about 18 through the International Space Station. I'll show an example of that. And then uh, other, some other countries have very substantial uh, portions of uh, the CubeSat launches, including Russia, of course, and India, as I mentioned before, has 14%. China has 5%. And then a lot of uh, small countries uh, in terms of their space programs, of course, Japan plays an important role, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, and, and, you know, but some very small countries that haven't been able to get into space have also been able to launch CubeSats. Uh, so so um, let's move on to the science behind what we're doing. Uh, the, the mission is called Temporal Experiment for Storms and Tropical Systems, and that makes a nice acronym of TEMPEST, with TEMP being for temporal. And, and TEMPEST addresses the U.S. National Academy's Earth Science Decadal Survey. So this is when uh, an impartial body of, uh, of um, scientists gets together and says, what should we do for the next 10 years? And so they're, they, what the, one of the things that they came up with was the most important science question in terms of what, why do convective storms, heavy precipitation, and clouds occur exactly when and where they do? So that's a big overarching question. But really to kind of improve models and improve prediction for weather prediction, what is really needed is higher temporal resolution of observations. Uh, so most of the satellites uh, that are looking into the clouds and precipitation, they're in low Earth orbit. And so they view, if you look at Denver or LA or New York City, uh, over one place on the Earth, they're able to view it really only once a day. And uh, with CubeSats, we have the promise of launching a train of them, like Planet did, and you know some of the companies with larger resources have done that. So we have, uh, we have the promise of launching a train of satellites. And so if we launch, uh, for instance, in the photo, in the illustration there, five satellites were proposed uh, to be launched for uh, five minutes apart. And uh, that then we can 
measure the temporal resolution of cloud and precipitation processes every three to four minutes for up to 30 minutes. So I will mention that weather satellites, uh, most of the images that you see are visible in infrared. And so those images, you know, with the geostationary weather satellites that are 100 times higher and they're, you know, 36,000 kilometers above the equator uh, and they're moving with the Earth in the same speed as the Earth's rotation, then they, they see the tops of the clouds in visible infrared wavelengths uh, and they see the uh, infrared temperature, cloud top temperature, but they don't penetrate into the clouds. And that's where millimeter wave gives us a lot, and microwave, gives us a lot more information. And so this is millimeter wave radiometry, and we're measuring uh, using the natural emission uh, from, the, from the clouds as well as the water vapor humidity in the atmosphere. So in any case, what we got was a NASA Earth Venture technology demonstration mission, and we delivered a 60 CubeSat two and a half years after the project start. And we a launch was provided by CSLI that I mentioned before. We were launched on orbital ATK, which was subsequently bought by Northrop Grumman, on a commercial resupply service mission. So also SpaceX op operates these commercial resupply service. They take a lot to the astronauts uh, and, uh, and cosmonauts at all on uh, the International Space Station. And so they um, we launched from NASA Wallops uh, May of last year and then deployed from the International Space Station uh, and the, the Japanese helped with that uh, with their uh, experiment module running the robotic arm uh, in July. In fact, we did it on Japanese local time. So all of us got up in the middle of the night to watch uh, the launch. And so uh, to to look at what kind of observations we'd get if we had five uh, CubeSats, we did a flyover with uh, JPL's instrument called a High Altitude Mimic Base Sounding Radiometer. And uh, we asked the pilot to vector over uh, some storms. It happens they were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, and it was piggybacked on another uh, experiment looking at atmospheric rivers in California. And so the um, but, but what the point is here is that there, were, there was development of these cells uh, over six-minute time intervals. So that encouraged us uh, to go ahead. And so the, the Tempest mission concept is complementary to Tropics, which is an Earth science mission uh, that's uh, scheduled to launch in a couple of years with uh, six CubeSats uh, focusing on hurricanes and typhoons on uh, getting greater uh, time sampling for them. And, and so Tempest really fits in well, as you see on the, uh, on the slide, in terms of the uh, vertical scale being the time scale and Tempest providing that three to 30 minutes. And GPM, sorry, Tropics provides um, sub-hourly time sampling, and then GPM is a much longer mission called the Google Precipitation Mission, uh, which is uh, producing excellent data. Following on the TRIM mission, Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission. Okay, so if we look more on the 6U CubeSat, uh, we see the XB1 bus, and you can also look at Blue Canyon Technologies' website in, in Boulder uh, for more information. But basically, this bus provides. So we look at the the uh, solar panels. Uh, we have there are six solar panels, uh, three out horizontally, and um, uh, three more canned at 45 degrees. One of those is actually not populated, so it's five solar panels provide us enough power to charge the battery, and, which is in the avionics module, shown on the lower right. And that avionics module is about one and a half U and includes a GPS antenna, two star trackers, a sun sensor, uh, three torque rods for magneto torquing, and uh, three uh, reaction wheels. So as well as the attitude control system, the flight computer, the electric power system. So there's a lot inside there. And then on the left, uh, you see the, the uh, sidewall that holds down the uh, solar panels. And, uh, and then and when the solar panels are released, the, the uh, instrument antenna is free to rotate as well. So the instrument specifically was built by JPL uh, based on a uh, lot of technology development, some of which I'll talk about. Uh, over the years, sponsored by NASA, and uh, and JPL built this instrument that uh, measures. Uh, it's a cross-track scanning radiometer, 
like most atmospheric sounding radiometers, and it scans uh, viewing the Earth scene. If you look in the middle illustration, uh, views the Earth scene over uh, plus to minus 60 degrees from Nader. Nader would be looking straight down, and then it continuously rotates. So it rotates at a speed of 30 RPM. So every two seconds, we view two calibration points. One we call cold sky looking to the right, that's from the cosmic microwave background, uh, from the Big Bang at 2.7 Kelvin, which is very uh, homogeneous and isotropic at our frequencies. And then when we look up, we look into the spacecraft that's bedded in, in the spacecraft and the instrument is a calibration target, a black body calibration target made by Zach's millimeter wave in California. And so every two seconds we get those three levels and we see the, the calibration on the right. This is extremely important for radiometry. We're measuring very, very small signals. And so gain, of, gain changes of less than a tenth of a dB, sometimes into the hundredths of a dB are important for us. That's why we have to calibrate so often. And then the technology is based on mimics uh, made by Northrop Grumman uh, with the collaboration of JPL. Uh, so Northrop Grumman has a 35 nanometer indium phosphide hemp process. Uh, they've now gone beyond that. Uh, 25 nanometer indium phosphide hemp, we've worked uh, near terahertz frequencies in the TWICE project. Uh, but this one was reported by Pekka Kongoslati, as you see in the left, uh, and Bill Deal and their coworkers uh, in the IMS proceedings in 2008 and 2012. And the measurements are shown in the upper right showing a noise temperature from 140 to 190 gigahertz of 300 to 350 Kelvin, which is the lowest noise temperature in the world. That's uncooled uh, and at room temperature. And uh, the reason we have this discontinuous graph here is we had WRO8 on the left and uh, WRO5 on the right uh, for two test sets. But the, the green curve shows the gain, so we have substantial gain of uh, 15 to 18 dB over that frequency range that I mentioned. And so uh, in addition to the LNAs, we need antenna and we need packaging uh, technology, uh, filtering technology. So a lot of technologies contributed. And we started on the left, as you see, that's called advanced component technology starting in 2009. Uh, I was a PI working with JPL and we designed a, uh, a feed horn for uh, these frequencies and uh, packaging technologies for front end and uh, waveguide technologies for filtering. And that started at TRL2 and at a TRL4. And then the second one from the left, uh, the NASA Instrument Incubator Program, uh, that was called Hammer. And uh, that put the technology on aircraft. Uh, it uh, matured the technology to TRL5. And then moving to the right, the third one uh, is the NASA um, Instrument Incubator Program for Tropospheric Water and Cloud Ice. I'll mention that near the end, which pushed us toward terahertz. And then finally, uh, Tempest on the right. So here's the Tempest instrument showing you some more detail on the, in the photo on the left. The, uh, on the lower right of the left photo, we see the scanning motor. Uh, the scanning axis is vertical here. And the, that's based on reaction wheels that have been tested for years at uh, Blue Canyon Technologies uh, in Boulder. And then the scanning reflector is an offset paraboloid reflector uh, collimating the received uh, signal uh, onto the uh, feed horn. The dual frequency feed horn is shown just above the uh, reflector. And then uh, the G band channels are shown on in the left photo from 164 to 181 gigahertz. So the front end is based on the 35 nanometer indium phosphide hemp LNA technology that I described. And they're, they're also uh, in the power divider. Wilkinson power divider has uh, active. Um, amplification as well to compensate for the insertion loss, and then a filter bank of waveguide iris filters, and moving to the left, um, detectors right at those frequencies. So we have direct detection at these G-band frequencies, and then video amplification and signal conditioning uh, to prepare the signals to go into the 
command and data handling uh, subsystem where the analog to digital converters are when you see the right photo at the top right. And then we look to the top left of the right photo, we see the W band front end. So that's a different waveguide output from the feed horn. And also in the lower part of the right photo, we see the ambient calibration target that I mentioned before for calibration. So uh, the instrument was, as I said, assembled at JPL and tested in thermal vacuum. Uh, the reason is to uh, look at the performance in the space environment. And we had, uh, on the left, we show uh, three and a half days of testing. And uh, when you, if you look at the warm target, you see the fluctuation in temperature of the actual radiometer. Uh, the lid target at the top is, uh, you know, thermally isolated, uh, and the cold target is uh, cooled with uh, liquid nitrogen. So we see that over minus 25 Celsius on the right to plus 60 Celsius, when we measure the gain versus temperature, we also measure the receiver noise temperature, uh, you know, can be converted to noise figure, uh, over temperature to see over the operating range uh, our performance and anticipate the performance on orbit. Then uh, some months, six, about six months later, we had the instrument integrated inside the spacecraft in January of 2018, and we did a thermal vacuum testing uh, pre-launch uh, and simulated the environment that the spacecraft uh, would encounter. And we found, if you look at the uh, table in the lower right, we see the frequencies from 87 to 181 gigahertz. Those are the center frequencies of the five channels I talked about before. They're all direct detection radiometers. And the second column shows the NEDT. So this is a measure of the radiometric resolution. So the smallest signal you can measure uh, above the noise, the smallest change in the input that you can measure going from 0.2 to 0.7 Kelvin. And uh, we get a reference of some of the Kelvin uh, measurements, but if you have a black body at room temperature, uh, you're measuring 300 Kelvin. And, um, and so you, you know, it, it varies depending on what you're looking at uh, in the Earth scene. Uh, the ocean is much colder and so on, but that gives you an idea. And then um, we measured the radiometric resolution over temperature, and we had very good agreement with uh, on-orbit values. So here's the 6U CubeSat uh, integrated in February of 2018, showing the, the uh, if you look at the lower right, of the uh, scanning motor and the uh, reflector are shown there. And then at the top, uh, top right, the Blue Canyon Technologies uh, avionics is shown as well. And you see the back of the solar panels on the left. So the, uh, the big day was May 21st of last year. And you see a lot of the team uh, uh, from uh, CSU at JPL, including NASA headquarters, uh, was uh, enjoying that day of the early morning launch of uh, of uh, Commercial Resupply Services 9 by Orbital ATK. And then, uh, so the astronauts had uh, the Tampa satellite uh, along with other CubeSats for uh, a couple of months till they got time to uh, deploy it uh, on July 13th of last year. And so I'm gonna show a short video, a uh, very short video. And it's, so on the left, the spacecraft will be deployed Tempest D will be deployed going to the lower right and on the right side to the upper left. So it's queuing up right now. Oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. So that was not my voice. That was the voice of somebody in mission control uh, saying that what wasn't supposed to happen is the, uh, the solar panels deploying. Well, they deployed and they it flapped like a bird, but they snapped into place and everything worked. So it was unexpected, uh, you know, so it should have been more like Qbert here. Qbert, uh, our, our twin that we were launched with, uh, is also a 6 u CubeSat and it has the same solar panels, but they were deployed later. So uh, Qbert is led by Joel Johnson at Ohio State University. Uh, it's to measure effective radio frequency interference and the, uh, the mitigation for radiometers. So that was July 13th of last year. And then on September 11th, we got our first light data. And our first light data shows the first full orbits. Uh, the, we didn't have perfect transmission to ground, but what we were able to get uh, was 
we measured uh, Hurricane Florence, which unfortunately made landfall in North Carolina uh, some days later. And so what we're showing on the upper right is um, the grayscale image is the visible image from the geostationary satellites that I mentioned earlier that are 100 times higher. And the color image is from Tempest D. So Tempest D peered into the storm, looked at the strength of the rain bands, uh, and measured it at 164 gigahertz, well, actually all five frequencies. But we're showing 164 gigahertz here in the top left when we show the color. And we measured not only Hurricane Florence, but two other hurricanes, Isaac and Helene, uh, here shown in the, um, uh, you know, in the, these uh, orbital scans, uh, orbital coverage of the, the swaths at 164 gigahertz brightness temperature and color and the insets, and the uh, grayscale is showing the visible from geostationary. So that was that was very exciting. And then 17 days later, we had an overpass from another 6U CubeSat, uh, coincident overpass over Typhoon Trammy in the Pacific Ocean, uh, and Tempest D and RainCube measured it together. RainCube is a KA band radar, basically a, a conventional weather radar on a satellite, and it's giving the vertical slice there these kind of towers that you see uh, that are rotating. The vertical slices from uh, rain cube and the horizontal sort of pancake on the surface there is uh, from Tempest D. And then if we look at, we got not only one level, but we get four levels in the atmosphere. Because this is based on the 183 gigahertz water vapor absorption line, so just the physics of water vapor, uh, then as you move closer and closer to the surface, you're getting more and more collisions. And those collisions spread out that, uh, you know, ideal delta function in, uh, in frequency. And, and uh, so as you move further away from that 183 gigahertz from 181 down to 164, you see deeper and deeper into the atmosphere. And so that was exciting. And then we found out we got not only, uh, we got not only, um, uh, hurricanes and typhoons and individual storms, but we got global data. So, of course, if it's working, we, we get global data, and we got that at 164, 174, 178, and 181 gigahertz. And you see different brightness temperatures because we're looking at different levels in the atmosphere, looking at different uh, amounts of water vapor. And then, uh, so those are the four higher, highest frequencies. And then the lowest frequency here at 87 gigahertz has uh, the greatest contrast between land and ocean. And this is exciting because we got, uh, we were able to get entire week of data. And here, if you look, uh, say you look at the latitude of around Australia, you know, to the, in the Atlantic and Pacific, you see a lot of storms that are moving through during that whole week. A lot of uh, gravity waves and atmospheric structures here. And also in the North Atlantic, there's a lot going on. So there's a lot in this data, and we're just beginning to uh, find the potential of the data. So that's an entire week of Tempest D data from a small CubeSat on orbit. Uh, then the question was, well, okay, you can measure individual storms. You can look over the whole globe. But what about, um, what about how well did you do? How accurately do you measure? And that's a good question. So NASA, uh, through the Globe Precipitation Measurement, or GPM project, has developed a technique for that. And basically, it's comparing uh, radio transfer, result of a radio transfer integral. So if, if we assume some atmosphere, or if we know it the, about the atmosphere from other sources after the fact, and then we see how much we expect the brightness temperature to be from those sources, and we compare that so that's a predicted value. We compare the predicted value with the observed value and take the difference. And so we use, and we do that for each of the two satellites that we're comparing and then take their difference. Then we remove most of the effects of the radio transfer model inaccuracies. So that's a lot of words, but what we're comparing with, if you look at the uh, table in the lower right, the first column shows you the GPM, the Global Microwave Imager, GMI, and then three MHSs. MHS is Microwave Humidity Sounder. Two of them are on European satellites, UMETSAT, and one of them is on a NOAA 
uh, satellite uh, NOAA 19. So the those are the standard references that we're comparing with. And then if you go back up to the second bullet, you see that we're within one Kelvin of the reference sensors. And our accuracy requirement was four Kelvin. So we beat that, we were at one Kelvin. And our stability or our precision is a half Kelvin or better. Uh, for f And so this is true for four out of five channels. And if you look at the uh, in the lower right, the uh, circled uh, in red numbers, you see that the, the tall pole of those numbers is the 164 gigahertz. And that one tends to have some model uncertainties uh, for some technical reasons about the uh, how much the ocean emits. So basically a conservative group of people uh, uh, went through this, and they found that Tempest D is a very well calibrated radiometer, indistinguishable from these gold standards of GMI and MHS that are operational class imaging radiometers. So uh, the Tempest D was also used to uh, compare with the operational algorithms from NOAA for weather prediction. And if you look at the swath, between the two red segments, if you will, that's the Tempest D orbit. So in between the red is from Tempest D, and outside of it is from MHS. Again, a standard using a uh, standard NOAA uh, algorithm. And um, and we see for water vapor on the left, uh, they're very uh, consistent. There's not a large discontinuities between the two uh, satellites. And then cloud liquid in the center and cloud ice on the right gives you uh, the cloud parameters that can be retrieved uh, from Tempest D, and they're showing consistency with NOAA as well. So a great thing that we can do since we have a single instrument on a satellite, and we, so we have control of the satellite, uh, you know, as opposed to the ATMS, the large one that I showed you, that there may be on uh, large weather satellites, there may be lots of sensors that are sensitive to the sun and Earth's magnetic field and so on or just sensitive to too much shaking. And so, uh, well, we didn't, didn't shake it, but what we did was uh, do, a, uh, do a 360. So we did a 360 in pitch, and we measured, uh, used the cosmic background as a source and the Earth as a contrast. Uh, we even saw the moon sometimes. You know, so we uh, found the scan-dependent biases uh, were less than a half a Kelvin, prior to our antenna pattern correction, where it got data to perform antenna pattern correction to get about an order of magnitude better than that. So another thing that we can do, since we have the flexibility for our satellite, is to, uh, to change from, once in a while, we change from cross-track scanning to a long-track scan. And this is, to our knowledge, not been done before with a, a passive microwave sounder or millimeter wave. And so, the cross track gives us a wide swath, whereas a long track gives us a narrow swath. So why would you want to do that? You know, you lose coverage. Well, you lose coverage, but you gain by looking at the atmosphere from different angles. Then that's important if you have a constellation of such satellites, then you, you're going to see storms at different angles. So, you know, so nadir being zero, and then moving off nadir, you get what we call the incidence angle, Earth incidence angle. Uh, where that ray intersects the Earth. And uh, and so uh, just due to Earth's rotation, the storms are going to move through when we're observing them every few minutes. So here's a, a track on the upper left and the upper right, the uh, kind of a segment of a parabola is the Tempest D uh, track, and the background is the, uh, the prediction product from NOAA, and we see that there's a lot of consistency. And then in the lower two plots, basically show as a function of that Earth incidence angle on the vertical axis, as we move along the horizontal axis, move along the track of the satellite, and we see consistency in a lot of the uh, retrievals. And the left is humidity, and the right is water in the clouds. So overall, we have... Net Tempest D is a NASA Earth Venture Technology Demonstration Mission. We met all of our requirements in the first 90 days of operations. And so we, you know, we planned it for 90 days and, of course, built things to work longer. And so far, uh, knock on wood, we have 
demonstrated more than 11 months of on order operations at a, and measured at 5 millimeter wave radiometer frequencies on a 6U CubeSat uh, using channels from 87 to 181 gigahertz. We demonstrated uh, quality that is indistinguishable from that acquired by uh, well-established radiometers. And of course, it is a fraction of the size and weight and cost significantly less. Uh, we've demonstrated cross calibration uh, with, uh, with uh, gold standard type sensors from NASA, NOAA, and Europe, U UMETSAT, uh, with accuracy of one Kelvin or better and stability of a half Kelvin or better uh, for four out of five channels. We've just demonstrated retrieval of water vapor, so that's humidity in the atmosphere, cloud liquid, and cloud ice water. So, for instance, the water vapor cannot be seen by radars except under very special circumstances. So that's the reason to use a millimeter wave radiometer, and we get a lot of, a lot of information from it uh, as well from uh, one sensor. So we've demonstrated good consistency with operational weather products, and uh, on the bigger scale, we've demonstrated deployment of new technology into space with just two and a half years from start to launch readiness. So showing a lot of uh, potential for the future to really test science quality technology uh, in, a, uh, in a short time frame and uh, low cost. So just a brief um, introduction to what I have, uh, what I'm working on as well, uh, a PI of the instrument incubator program called tropospheric water and cloud ice. So we use uh, 16 frequencies from 118 to uh, 850 gigahertz, and, um, and we make measurements of uh, ice cloud uh, particle size uh, by measuring uh, at the differences at different wavelengths uh, using submillimeter wave to terahertz. And uh, this radiometer is designed for a 6U CubeSat and has 12 watts of power consumption, and we're just uh, demonstrating it now. So the data from Tempest will be available uh, next week uh, on tempest.colostate.edu. That's tempest.colostate.edu. And we'd like to thank uh, you for attending and the NASA Earth Venture Program for their support, as well as the NASA Earth Science Technology Office for program management. And um, as part of uh, NTT webinar series, we'd like to Mention the uh, important IEEE MTT SAT challenge. So this is an exciting opportunity for students. Uh, students can be from one or more universities, and um, the team members must be uh, students for a degree and have a faculty coordinator or advisor for their project. And so you can submit a proposal by the deadline of the 1st of October. So you've got about a month and a half. Uh, and the website is mttsat.mtt.org, mttsat.mtt.org. You can also look back uh, for at the, these slides. And um, the proposal has a maximum of 10 pages, and that gives the information on what's required for the proposal. Thank you very much. Great. Thank, thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, that was a really Really cool stuff, um, and thanks for mentioning this uh, this CubeSat challenge as well. That looks like a great opportunity. Uh, so it is it's time for our question and answer session right now. Um, I've got a couple, but uh, please feel free to uh, to ask your questions and submit those through the Q and A panel. Uh, so the question I have is, uh, could you tell us a little more about um, the packaging and integration challenges you faced? In to this? Sure. Yes, if we go back to, uh, let's just go back to the general instrument slide. So a lot of work was done in uh, first packaging the mimics uh, reliably and uh, getting waveguide filters, uh, working at these frequencies. So the bandwidths are a couple of gigahertz, you know, one to one to four gigahertz, depending on the channel. Uh, the the 87 gigahertz is a little bit wider, and then and then uh, matching the detectors at the RF frequency as well. Uh, and so you know VDI has been helpful with that. 
and uh, the JPL has, has done a lot of the work. And we did uh, a lot of the early component design uh, on the waveguide on the uh, waveguide filters at CSU, and did uh, prototype testing. Uh, and then for front end radiometer architecture, uh, it's it's important to to build something that's modular as well as uh, being so small. And what I didn't mention is that the the low power consumption uh, is greatly helped by having um, direct detection radiometers. There there are a variety of ways to do it. You you can have heterodyne radiometers if you need a lot of channels um, near say near one of the absorption lines. But uh, I think there there are a lot of good um, you know, a lot of lessons learned from uh, the packaging and integration. Okay. Uh, so we've got a handful of questions rolling in here, so this is great. Please uh, please definitely feel free to, to submit more. So here's a question. Uh, how does this technology compare advantages and disadvantages to Earth-based sensors like weather balloons or fixed location radiometers? Okay, that's a great question. The... Um, the main limitation of ground-based uh, measurements is that they give you only one point in space. And so it's, it's similar to if you have a, a thunderstorm cell that's coming by uh, and it only lasts, you know, they typically last less than a half hour. And then you think, okay, well, is that the length of the thunderstorm or is it just the winds blowing it by and it's raining somewhere else? So you really you can't tell the difference between those two things of whether it actually ended or it's just raining on somebody else. So therefore, um, the the any kind of ground-based measurement or even airborne measurement for a campaign is limited. I mean, NASA and other uh, scientific partners, as well as in Europe and, and other places, have been able to do uh, Bigger campaigns, you know, particularly when they have a UAV that can stay aloft for over 24 hours, uh, you can do a, a longer-term campaign. But whenever, let's say, people uh, go out with uh, shipborne sensors and uh, want to measure ocean meteorology, uh, they are they're limited by that particular case study. So it becomes a lot of case studies where this is a global measurement. Um, so. One would have a hard time using these frequencies from from the ground unless you're at a very high uh, elevation uh, above sea level, uh, because uh, you get too strong of a signal when you're looking looking straight up. It's too much water vapor, and so for that we use uh, K-band uh, radiometers, and and so you know I, I think each each of them are complementary, and and we did start with uh, ground-based radiometers at CSU in, in learning the technology. And, um, and there's, there's some very important networks, including in Europe uh, and uh, into the Middle East that, uh, I believe, North Africa that are, that are measuring uh, water vapor over uh, broad areas of the continent. And um, so I'll turn it back to you, Mike. Sure. Yeah, no, that, that, that was great. Um, Okay, so this next question, uh, first off, they start off by saying thanks for the wonderful presentation, but also how does Tempest perform signal processing? Does it have a digital back end? That's a good question. Tempest does not have a digital back end. Uh, we have five millisecond samples on each of these five channels. Uh, so our total data rate, including um, housekeeping, is just over 10 kilobits per second continuously. So we, we bring all of that data down to the ground. Uh, we do have an FPGA uh, that, that does averaging on board. Uh, but in terms of what's, you know, very advanced signal processing, uh, that's not what we do here. Uh, our, our partner satellite, Qbert, uh, which I encourage you to look up information about that one, uh, it uses a digital backend and, uh, and does uh, Measurements with uh, one gigahertz uh, bandwidth over a one hundred a one gig, sorry a one gigahertz bandwidth that's uh, selectable from six to forty gigahertz, uh, and so it can measure it just one channel uh, at once, and then it it uh, detects radio frequency interference and it does some sophisticated processing and uh, is involved with improvement of the uh, correction of 
weather satellites, you know, uh, mitigation of radio frequency interference effect on weather satellites that is now done by, uh, for instance, NASA's uh, Soil Moisture Active Passive SMAP mission. Uh, but that one is about a well, 24 gigahertz, sorry. 24 megahertz in bandwidth, and so Hubert is extending that to one gigahertz. And uh, so uh, there, there's definitely a lot of potential uh, for uh, signal processing and signal detection. We just decided to bring all the data down to the ground and uh, the relatively low data rate from uh, five-channel radiometer. Great. Okay, uh, next question here is, what is the spatial resolution of the measurements? Oh, that's a good question. The spatial resolution varies from uh, 13 kilometers at our uh, highest frequency to 25 kilometers at our lowest frequency. And this is very comparable with operational radiometers, which generally have larger antennas, but they, they fly higher as well. So that is um, that's uh, commensurate with, uh, with the state-of-the-art uh, for for these measurements. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, next question here. Tempest D does not include traditional 37, 60, and 118 gigahertz frequencies. Is retrieval accuracy comparable to those from ATMS and MHS? Oh, that's a great question too. Uh, the the retrievals. They're right that the larger sensors. Uh, have lower frequencies, and it would be really nice to have those as well on Tempest D. And, um, you know, we look forward to people developing um, deployable antenna technologies that can have low enough losses to do that uh, from a CubeSat radiometer. For instance, RainCube uh, as a radar, KA band radar deployed a half meter size antenna from their 6U CubeSat and use that successfully. Uh, so, so we'd like to do that in the future, um, and and that's an open question in terms of the the uh, how the retrieval accuracy relates. I would say that the um, you know there's definitely more information uh, the the more bands that you can measure. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Uh still have a few minutes here, so we try to sneak in a few more questions. What are the environmental factors that you consider to design these CubeSats? Well, okay, so the there's the temperature range we operate over, so that's what I mentioned about environmental testing. In uh, thermal vacuum chamber, we, we look at how they'll operate in vacuum. We look at vibration as well. I didn't show a slide on. We did uh, vibration testing both of the instrument at JPL and the of the integrated spacecraft at uh, Blue Canyon Technologies. Uh, well, at a contractor for them, we did uh, so three-axis vibration testing. Usually, the radiometer receivers don't have a lot of problem with with vibration. Okay, and then there's also radiation. So the uh, radiation of uh, high energetic particles coming from the sun. Uh, definitely is a consideration, particularly because uh, with CubeSats, we mostly rely on um, commercial technologies. Uh, we, we get military grade, obviously, when we can, but sometimes the, the, um, the, the space qualified uh, components are not available within the time frame for this short um, you know, the short development time, and sometimes they increase the cost by a large factor, as you're probably aware. So we, we rely mostly on commercial technologies. Uh, some of the more uh, robust radiation testing that we do is based on the FPGAs and the memory uh, devices that, that tend to be more, more sensitive to uh, high energetic particles uh, in, in the space environment. So these are important things to uh, take into consideration, and uh, NASA has a database of, uh, of uh, components that have been tested for radiation hardness uh, that are often used in the small satellite uh, community. Thanks. Okay, so, uh, yeah, that, no, that, that's great. Uh, how much did it cost to build and fly? 
Well, the I would say this is on the order of um, on the order of five million dollars for the overall project. Uh, we we did build a spare and uh, and so that cost a little bit more. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a general five billion U.S. dollars is probably a general round number, maybe maybe six, for for uh, everything from beginning to end on this. Now, if we had to make a copy, it wouldn't uh, wouldn't cost that much. Right, right. There's some some NRE there. Still small mm -hmm. compared to uh, geostationary satellites. Yeah, this is tiny. Yeah. Cost wise, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, again, it doesn't do the same thing uh, as ATMS or MHS. It's not an exact copy of those. And and it, it okay. I, I didn't talk about lifetime. I'll just mention that we expect it to stay in orbit uh, for three plus years. So another probably another two and a half years. Uh, so if it's uh, still functioning at that time, we hope to be continuing to provide. Uh, excellent weather data. They, they, these satellites have no propulsion uh, because they've gone through the International Space Station uh, in terms of the, the danger to astronauts. Uh, and but but some other groups uh, that launch satellites, CubeSats differently, are working on propulsion techniques, and they could conceivably keep it up uh, in uh, in, the, in orbit. Excuse me, uh, before burning up in the atmosphere, could keep it up longer. Or there are other technologies that are that are chosen to try to deorbit satellites after their useful lifetime for for CubeSats. So I just wanted to give a sure. preview of that. Uh, and then let's uh, let's try to sneak in uh, one more here. Um, so has terahertz remote sensing retrievals for rain and humidity already been tried, or will the next CubeSat be one of the first attempts to do that? Oh, that's a great question. The um, the Europeans are launching a sensor to measure uh, cloud ice. Uh, it's an operational sensor on a large satellite. Uh, I believe it'll launch on MetUp uh, second generation in 2021 or approximately. So uh, that's going to, to test the submillimeter wave frequencies for measuring ice clouds. Uh, so, uh, I don't know of any other plans to to launch it, and we're you know this instrument is a state of the art. It can be also paired with uh, radars to get more information about higher vertical resolution in the cloud, and uh, and I think uh, perhaps pairing this with a radar for a small satellite would be a, a great future project uh, for NASA to do. So uh, I uh, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Okay, and then I guess just to just to play clean up here, there's there is one question about uh, you know the the increasing number of cubesats here. Uh, does it contribute to space debris, debris? Do they fall out of Earth orbit? But just a quick answer on that. Most of the large numbers of satellites are uh, are launched by commercial companies. Uh, I think compared to the total number of objects in space debris, most of them are from much older. Missions and um, you know, of, or of satellites that have had the collisions and uh, produced lots of small parts. Uh, but I think we should all keep that in mind of the precious resource of space uh, as we go forward. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, we are out of time. Uh, as we said earlier, the session will be archived on the Society website at ntt.org. And all registrants will get an email reminder with a website address when that's available. For attendees who would like to receive PDH credits, please follow the link in the webcast view and use the code that's provided on the last slide of this presentation, which is shown right now. Once again, I'd like to thank MTTS, who's our sponsor for this webinar, and Professor Rising for this excellent and informative presentation. Also, a special thanks to our audience for joining us today. We hope you found today's event valuable, that you return for future IEEE Microwave Theory and Te Technique Society website, uh, webcast. Thank you and have a great day.